I want to thank Elena for such a, a welcoming invitation uh, to give this talk. I'm really, really delighted to be here with all of you today. I um, briefly want to share with you that although I'm not an exotech like some of you, I many, maybe most of you, I assume, as a teenager, I had a little taste of the experience and pride that exotechs have. My brother studied at El Tec de Monterrey, Ciudad de Mexico, back in the 1990s, and he absolutely loved his school. In various occasions, I went to visit, uh, actually being smuggled into the campus, and spent time in its beautiful gardens and, back then, modern, impressive buildings. Anyway, um, why... Uh, me talking to you about Mexicans in Australia. In 2008, I went to Sydney to do my PhD at UNSW and did a five-year research on this community, the Mexicans in Australia. The research involved many strategies from being part of this community, mixing with its members, researching existing data like documents and census data, uh, all the way to collecting and analyzing my own data that I gathered through an extensive survey and personal interviews. As you can imagine, I had a massive amount of data that I had to make sense of it. Um, I looked at the information provided um, back then uh, when I was doing my research, my original research, I looked at the information provided at the most recently available data back then, that was the 2011 Australian census. And from this source, I had the official uh, number of Mexicans in Australia, although back then and now, everybody says that it is a very rough and underestimated figure. I'll show you some numbers shortly. Then I designed, implemented, and distributed my own survey questionnaire among the Mexican community in Australia, not targeting students, I must um, clarify that. Uh, as you uh, Mexicans in Australia know, there is a large floating population of Mexicans that go and study for uh, diverse uh, periods of time. Some people go for a month or two months to study English, and some people go for longer periods like me that I was doing uh, a PhD. From this nationwide effort, uh, the survey, I reached 20% of the Mexican population living in Australia, according to these official numbers. Then I conducted 30 interviews with Mexicans in Sydney, Melbourne, and Canberra. And actually, several of the people I interviewed are uh, joining us tonight, tonight in Mexico, morning in Australia. Most of my knowledge of the Mexican community comes from these very intensive five years of my life living in Australia and doing research. Um, since my return to Mexico, I have been informally following news on Australia and keeping in touch with friends uh, who keep me connected to the country. But finally, for uh, when Elena invited me, uh, proposed the idea of um, having this talk, um, I prepare, I looked at the most recent data from the census, the 2016 Australian census data, and I updated um, most of the information that I'll be presenting today. So you will notice that um, when I show certain information, it will say if it's uh, older than 2016, but most information comes from the Australian census. Um, the, the 2016 Australian census, I mean. Um, so what's the purpose of this presentation? To offer a panoramic overview of the profile of Mexicans in Australia, and more specifically, uh, offer an overview of uh, participation in the labor market of these skilled migrants in Australia as, um, you'll see, and as I'll be explaining, and to some that already know my uh, work in this area, most Mexicans in Australia are skilled, highly skilled. 
Uh, what's the organization of the presentation? Very briefly, I'll give you some context for um, the emigration and immigration of Mexicans in Australia, some numbers on skilled migrants uh, around the world, just briefly to put it in context, some, uh, some sort of demographic characteristics of this population. And finally, as you can see in bold, uh, I will be focusing on the participation in the labor market of these Mexicans in Australia. Now, when you, when, um, at least in Mexico, I guess, well, not I guess, it varies around the world, but when we hear Mexican migrants, especially Mexico and the US, we see people crossing the border without documentation uh, in very vulnerable conditions, working in, um, in the fields or in the service sector, mainly in the United States. And uh, we typically see people that come from underprivileged uh, contexts with a low um, uh, level of education, um, poor or no English knowledge, etc. Now I call these, uh, these migrants that I study the other migrants. These are migrants that are professionals, that are uh, highly skilled, that um, have cosmopolitan lives, um, that are able to mingle with uh, people from diverse nationalities that have a, a good uh, command of the English language, etc. cetera. Um, so I gathered here some pictures from associations of Mexicans, um, professional Mexicans around the world. And as you see, as you can see in the bottom image is Mario Molina, um, one of the Nobel laureates uh, from Mexico who did his, most of his um, academic career in the United States. Um, so this group, this new group, I call it new group. It's not so new, but it, there's something new about it new compared to the long history of Mexican migration to the United States. This is a new group of Mexican migrants that is strikingly different from earlier groups in, um, in the different uh, spheres and phases that I just mentioned earlier. It's more evenly distributed across gender. Most um, Mexican migration that is uh, low skilled is uh, dominated by males, although in recent decades, more women have started to migrate. But among the, um, the professionals, these highly skilled, uh, I call them also middle-class migrants, Mexican migrants, um, there's a more evenly distributed uh, gender, more, more gender balance. Um, it's relatively small compared to most previous um, migrations, other types of migration. Most of them, as I already mentioned, uh, can be identified among professionals and highly skilled individuals. Uh, in Australia, this is important to mention, there has been a shortage of tertiary educated workers, not only tertiary educated, but tertiary educated mainly, particularly since the 1990s. And this uh, shortage and obviously the immigration policy in Australia has opened new markets and opportunities for skilled migrants um, from new originating countries. I mean new because uh, in Australia there hasn't been a long history of Mexican migrants. So it's a new originating country for Australia, Mexico. And these, Mex and these um, Mexicans, these tertiary educated Mexicans uh, have more options to explore in this new country. Now, what's the context? There has been, uh, why, why more in recent decades and not at another period in history? Uh, there's been significant economic changes in Mexico since the 1980s. These um, would be well known by my economics uh, colleagues and students that some of them are here. I really thank your um, presence today. Um, these 
economic changes have uh, translated into the implementation of a new economic model that has reshaped the structure of the Mexican society. And some of the uh, consequences of this new economic model, not all, some, have been um, the worsening of general uh, living conditions in Mexico that is marked by uh, income inequality, more concentration of wealth uh, among the elite of the population and a contraction of formal op employment opportunities. Um, and sometimes there's even formal op employment opportunities, but they are not as well paid and with the um, work-life balance that many of these professionals expect. So they find, uh, they look in Mexico, many of these tertiary educated uh, people look for adaptive solutions. Uh, there's many different types of adaptive solutions, but in this case, um, Mex these Mexicans have opted for migration and migration to a new destination. Um, let's say an unknown destination for most Mexicans. Uh, the other important factor, I won't uh, delve into it because it's not the point of this talk. I know, as Elena mentioned, you're interested um, in hearing more about um, who are these Mexicans in Australia. But I think it's important to mention that globalization has played a big role into this. I mean, why all of a sudden Mexicans thought about going to Australia? Perhaps the Sydney 2000 Olympics played a big role. Um, I heard this from several interviewees back when I was uh, in Australia. And uh, there's research uh, that shows that the Olympics open um, people from around the world, and especially within this new globalization era, uh, let's say from the 1980s, 1990s till today, where communications technology has helped us to see what happens in different parts of the world. Of course, the Olympics are not new, but the possibility of seeing the Olympics and the city and the, the cities in which they hold the Olympics, the infrastructure and all that information is more readily available now than any other time than any other time in the past. So uh, one, and that's perhaps one of the reasons why Australia is um, holding the Olympics again in Brisbane um, soon in a couple of years. And it's being very, very important because it is a huge way of attracting um, migrants and especially the type of migrants that Australia targets, which are highly skilled typically. So some numbers. Um, just very briefly on international migrants. Uh, the most recent a number available from 2020 from the International Organization of Migration is that in the world, there were um, 281 million migrants. Migrants means someone that was born in one country and is living at the time of um, the census in a different country. This is roughly 3%, 3.6% of the world population. And that this hasn't changed uh, dramatically in many decades. The international migration figures has stayed around 3% of the population. Of course, world population has grown. Mexicans worldwide account for around 12 million people. And their main destination, as you already know, is uh, the United States, nearly 90% perhaps more of these Mexicans um, abroad, away from Mexico, are in the US. In recent decades, there has been um, a diversification of destinations, including Australia. Um, and now focusing on the skilled migrants in the OECD countries, we only, this is a, this is, um, a strong limitation. I think I have it written here. Um, one of the major barriers for conducting my um, research on migrants is that there's a lot of difficulties for measuring migratory flows and stocks and actually ha having information on migration. 
So as you can see, the most recent data on skilled migration, official data um, worldwide is from the OECD and it's from 2016 and which is quite old, you know, we are already 2020, 2022. And this was 40 million skilled, not Mexicans, but skilled migrants around the world. Um, so where highly educated migrants come from? This is very interesting. Um, Mexico is in the seventh place, as you can see. India, China, Philippines, UK, Germany, Poland, and Mexico. Um, migrants that are residing in OECD countries. As you can see, um, from India, for example, uh, it's three times the amount of skilled migrants living in OECD countries. Yet, look at the column on the right, the amount, uh, the, the population of India, this is 1,000 million people, while Mexico has uh, 123 million people. Um, and we can say that the same for, for what well, we can analyze this further, but it's not the point of this talk, but I think it's an interesting figure. And to have Mexico there is probably new for most of you, because as I said, when we think of, of Mexican migrants, uh, we think of that first three pictures I showed you. And as you see, as you can see here, um, there's a significant number in the world of Mexican skilled, highly educated migrants. So following on uh, some numbers, now specifically on Mexican migrants, Mexico by volume of skilled migrants in OECD countries is number one in Latin America and the seventh worldwide, as I showed in the previous slide. Approximately 1 million Mexican professionals are residing in the USA who hold a bachelor's degree or a master's and PhD. Mind you, very important to notice on these 1 million Mexican professionals, more than 50% of these migrated as children, which makes it a completely different experience. And, uh, and not only the experience, but the fact that they were educated in the US makes it a totally different profile. I've done substantial work uh, with a subset of these Mexicans in the United States. Again, this is not a, the purpose of this talk, but just, a, just uh, for you to know. Uh, and I focused on those who received tertiary educated education in Mexico and then migrated to the US. Um, so what I will be talking to you about today, finally, is these Mexicans in Australia. I'll talk about their, well, I won't talk about their reasons for my, this is, um, this is the list of topics that I covered when I did uh, my PhD. That is reasons for migrating, which I can briefly mention the four predominant uh, reasons were quality of life, a better to, to enjoy a better quality of life uh, for the adventure. Uh, some others uh, to join a partner because they married an Australian or that was the fourth reason. And the third reason was to escape insecurity in Mexico, which is connected to um, the concept of quality of life. And I won't um, delve into it either. Um, I, I will focus on the sum of the sociodemographic characteristics, just the profile. Uh, I also, for the original project, uh, looked into the reasons to choose Australia as a destination, the temporality uh, trends of their migration, where they, uh, for a brief period, did they intend to stay since the beginning? Things changed after they had been there. That's some of the topics I looked into. Their national identity, how they identify themselves as Mexicans, as Mexican Australians, as something else. Uh, I also looked at social class identity. Uh, I looked at um, work and income uh, patterns, characteristics, family patterns and gender roles, and finally social life and friendship. So as you can see, I covered uh, a lot of ground 
uh, with this research. It was a pioneer research. Um, there was no previous research on Mexicans in Australia. And then I had to build from scratch um, this entire picture uh, that I'm um, that I I became an expert on. So today, as you can see in uh, highlighted in blue, I will uh, mention some sociodemographic uh, characteristics, and I will also talk about some um, topics related to work and income. Now, this is uh, the Mexicans. Uh, by birth residing in Australia at the time of the censuses. As you can see, these are all official statistics and uh, very small numbers of Mexican migrants in, uh, in Australia recorded from 1881 all the way, let's say to the 1990s. And then all of a sudden from 2001, uh, onward, that is the mark when um, they reach a thousand people, uh, there is an increase, consistent increase over the years from 1,000 to 1,800. Then 2011, which was the figure I mostly worked with when I did my research in Australia, 3,255 people. And then the most recent uh, available official number is 4,871 Mexicans in Australia. As I mentioned earlier, um, most people say this is an underestimated. It's not that it's an underestimated. A sense, I won't also, or I won't give you a lecture on censuses, but a census is a picture of a, a country in a particular, of the population, of, of uh, households and population, of a particular country, in this is case, in one particular day uh, that the census is taken. So at, at the time of the census, in the, that um, the information was collected in 2016, there were recorded that answered the census, uh, 4,800 Mexicans in Australia. Yes, uh, I talked about this uh, on the phone the other day with Elena, many, of the ones that are students, um, maybe they were not, uh, maybe on 2016, they were uh, students in 2016, but they were not in Australia at the time of the census, then they are not recorded. Uh, also, it is a difficulty for the Australian um, uh, authorities to reach students, not only Mexicans, students in general. Students, when they see the census, they think it doesn't apply to them. So they don't, don't answer censuses. So this is one, one of the many reasons why they're not there. Now, some uh, demographics, basic overview of demographics. Uh, when you see CPH is Census of Population and Housing, Australia Bureau of Statistics, which is the uh, most important uh, organization, institution for collecting statistics in Australia. And it's from the census, the most recent census, 2016. So 52% females, 48% males, more females than males, but fairly balanced. Young migrants, 69% are under 40 years of age. Uh, a high prominence of marriage, 40% never married and 30% sorry, 47% married and 37% never married, and the rest in different categories, separated, divorced, widowed, etc. 80%, which is a really high uh, figure, with tertiary educated, I'm here considering 20 years and over. Of course, I'm not considering, I, when I uh, calculated this number, I did not consider children because obviously they would not be tertiary educated. 60% uh, live in Sydney uh, or Melbourne. I'll show you some um, numbers about that. The vast majority speak English, have a high level of English proficiency. 63% arrived between 2006 and 2015, which shows that it's a fairly recent migration of all the Mexicans recorded in the sense 2016 census, the vast majority, let's say over 50% arrived uh, 
between 2006 and 2015. Then the following figure doesn't come from the census. The census doesn't collect where they come from. This comes from my survey, that a survey I conducted, as that I mentioned earlier in the talk. 62% come from Mexico City, 11% from Monterrey, Guadalajara, or Puebla. So mainly, there's um, the migration dominated by Mexico City, the big metropolis. Now, what's their place of residence? Probably most um, most of you uh, here. I there's a there's a little problem with the with the bracket, but anyway, the bracket, the 60% was meant to cover Sydney and Melbourne, the 31% in Sydney and Melbourne, 29%. That adds up to 60%. I, I changed the format of the presentation and I didn't realize that had that moved. And then you can see the rest. No? So it's mainly concentrated in those two cities and most of you already know that. English proficiency, this information is quite interesting, I, I think. Um, it's divided by male, female, and total. I'll just show you the percentages of the total. If we add up, um, so speaks English only, we man, I imagine um, I'll have to do further um, research and work with the numbers, but I imagine these are children. Um, and that's why they only speak English. But then uh, in the census, they ask them if they speak another language and how, well they speak English and as you see 81% uh, of Mexicans in Australia say they speak very well and well English. Uh, so probably uh, as I said the 50% above is may probably may, um, consistent of children and the following are uh, the majority of the people uh, we're, we're talking about right. Uh, now, what are their occupations? Again, this is um, information related to the census. As you see at the bottom of the table, it says it include, excludes the three following categories, inadequately described. People at the census uh, office couldn't understand what, what they do for work, what's their occupation. They, it was not stated or not applicable. What we see here is quite interesting again. Um, 14% are managers. Uh, this is how the census records this information. Managers, professionals. Uh, professionals are engineers, doctors, architects, um, economists, academics. All of those are professionals. And if we add up these two categories, managers and professionals, it would be, which would be the type of jobs that uh, professionals would be looking for uh, the type of jobs they would be looking for when, when they look for a job to be either uh, professionals or uh, managers. Mexicans are 40% uh, of the Mexicans that work in Australia. So these are around 3000 people uh, recorded in the census, of course. These are 47%. Uh, and then you can see the distribution in other types of occupations, technicians and trades workers, uh, so plumbers, electricians, all types of trades workers, um, locksmiths, for example, community and personal service workers, um, all the vast uh, occupations that are there, 14%, uh, clerical and administrative workers, 12%, sales workers, machinery operators and drivers and laborers. Now, how is the personal income distributed? This is an interesting graph uh, uh, illustration. Mm -hmm. um, negative income means people don't receive an income and have a need to borrow, it's a small amount. Neil income have no income. Who would we count it in here? Perhaps some people that responded that they um, they don't have any income, like for example, um, stay at home mothers or fathers would be included perhaps in this category. Now let's see the, the rest. It's fairly um, well distributed along all the different, these are the figures for um, personal income, annual personal income, right? 
Uh, I remember when I lived in Australia, people, um, these professional migrants would say that they would target a, a, a six figure salary, annual salary. And six figure means from $100,000 annually um, upward, right? So if we see that figure, uh, it's the, the, um, the shaded in, in blue, not the light blue at the top, but shaded in blue, the first, uh, let's say the first three rows would cover that. Uh, now, this doesn't give you, uh, um, a, are they doing well or they're not doing well? This is the question, right? Well, how do we know if they're doing well? Well, I made the exercise uh, of comparing with Australians. What I did was uh, cal I calculated the number of persons reporting personal income by income bracket. And of course, Mexicans are only 4,000 um, that are reporting an income and Australians are 11 million. So of course, um, uh, these has, the, the percentages are according to the total population of each birthplace, Mexico or Australia. What do we see here? This is a, the most interesting, I think, um, uh, graph that I'll show you today. Look at the first one, two, three rows. What did you see on this, those first three rows? Uh, proportionally, Mexicans, so the first four rows are longer when they are green. This is Mexico and shorter in the case of Australia for these first four rows. This means that Mexicans at these levels, so from 65,000 and above dollars per year, income, personal income and above, fare better than Australians. In the rest of the income brackets, Australians dominate. So we're seeing that Mexicans fare fairly well in the top salaries, uh, salary brackets. And remember, these are most Mexicans in Australia are young. Of course, you can notice that the nil income, so no income, it's a very long line. So again, we're probably looking at perhaps some students that reporting having no income or uh, and uh, stay at home uh, family members. Um, now, this is the last um, chart that I'll show you. Um, it is a, it, there is a lot of information in this chart, so I need you to, to follow me uh, closely. So in order to make a better balance of the achievements of Mexicans in Australia in the labor market, I made an international comparison. So one comparison was um, the previous um, uh, charts that I where I illustrated the differences on personal income uh, between Mexicans and Australians. And here I chose uh, five countries uh, population by birthplace. So Mexico, Brazil, Australia, South Africa, and Colombia. Why did I choose these countries? Well, I chose um, Brazil and Colombia as being um, Latin American countries that would have similar, that, that should have, if we think generally, should have similar conditions to Mexicans in Australia. Uh, I will not, uh, and why South Africa? To illustrate what happens with uh, migrants that are from an Anglo background. And Australia, well, as the um, locals who have no disadvantages regarding uh, the labor market in, in, uh, in the first place, right? So I will not go into the details of the methodology behind this chart, but if anyone is interested, I will gladly explain. Basically, what this table shows is that when those born in Australia, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and South Africa are compared in terms of their educational level and their level of employment. So what do you, what do you see here? I'll show you. I hope you can see my, um, my mouse here on the screen. Total population. 
So the total population of Mexicans in Australia, Brazilians, Australians, um, so born in, born in Australia, Australians are 15 uh, million. Uh, South Africans, 162,000, Colombians, 18,000. Now, those who hold post-secondary -second, second, second, education and have a val valid occupation, so this is information from the census again, uh, these are the figures, 2,500 uh, for Mexicans, Brazil, etc. right? Now, I classified in tertiary educated and vocationally educated. Who are the tertiary educated? Those who have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a uh, PhD, those are the tertiary educated. Who are the vocationally educated? People who typically go to a TAFE, who have a certificate, um, graduate certificate, they call it in Australia, et cetera. Now, who are the professionals, paraprofessionals, medium skilled jobs, uh, uh, hold medium skilled jobs, manual and semi skilled jobs? Para professionals are the ones that I mentioned earlier academics, engineers, MDs, accountants, et cetera. Paraprofessionals are the managers uh, who, are the, who hold medium skilled jobs, technicians and clerics, and manual and semi skilled jobs are retailers, drivers, laborers. Now, what I want you to see here, um, so those with tertiary education, no, these first four rows here, Mexicans achieve uh, better jobs than Brazilians and Colombians. Uh, how, how do uh, I reach this conclusion? Because if they're tertiary educated, they will be targeting jobs as professionals or paraprofessionals, remember? So if we add up or at least look at the professional figure, Mexicans hold jobs as professionals 40%. Compared to Brazilians, only 29%. And compared to Colombians, only 28%. How do South Africans fare? Very similar to Australians. 59% of tertiary educated South Africans hold um, jobs as professionals, while those born in Australia hold, 60% um, of them hold jobs as professionals. Um, although my Mexicans do not rank as well as migrant groups from Anglo-Saxon countries represented here by South Africans, Mexicans do perform better than similar groups, as I said, Brazil or uh, Colombia. Um, I won't go into detail either here, but there are significant number of studies in Australia that point to the labor market disadvantages that are faced by uh, groups from non-Anglo-Saxon uh, backgrounds, despite the Australian uh, official uh, multicultural policy. Um, this would be, make sense, um, a lot of sense to Mexicans in Australia that are here today with us, um, perhaps less so to other uh, of all, uh, people in our audience. So what are the, some of the difficulties that Australians find, Mexicans find in the Australian labor market? First, so remember, most of them are professional migrants and they migrate to Australia looking for a job. And the first barrier they encounter is that they need Australian experience to find the first job. Um, the second, um, the second um, barrier difficulty that Mexicans face in the labor market is a low recognition of their skills and they uh, experience deprofessionalization processes. That means um, some of them are, for example, um, uh, dentists and their um, education as dentists is not recognized in Australia and they need to uh, first find a job. And this is what uh, the literature uh, refers to as deprofessionalization. 
And secondly, they need uh, to, to do all kinds of tests um, to, be, to have their skills recognized. And the third barrier, despite the fact that we have talked, uh, we saw on the census and people reported uh, having uh, a high command of the English language. And despite people speaking English in Australia, they find that it is still a barrier, that they still have a disadvantage compared to those who speak English as a first language, that they are um, not taken as seriously as people in the labor market, as seriously as people who speak English as, a, as natives, uh, and, and, and the consequences of that in the labor market. Um, Enid Mendoza, can you turn your mic off, please? Because we hear all the water flushing. Thank you. Um, now, from my survey, 53% experienced uh, finding work in Australia difficult. From all the people I interviewed, 53% experienced finding work difficult. Um, so this is a considerable uh, barrier. Uh, it is a difficult, uh, it is difficult to find the first job, at least in Australia, while only 20% found it easy. And of course, I interviewed um, people on this entire spectrum from finding it difficult all the way to finding it easy and all the experiences they went through. So to conclude, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, the context for this migration, um, there's various uh, factors um, that uh, are taking place behind this migration, but as I mentioned, globalization is uh, uh, at the backdrop of all, of all this entire process, more uh, and more readily available means of communication, of transportation, uh, cheaper ways of uh, transportation, uh, more professionals migrating around the world, not just Mexicans, uh, more of these professionals looking for new destinations. Um, what do we see? Yes, there are difficulties in the labor market, but Mexicans uh, seem to have uh, a relatively successful insertion into the labor market, as I mentioned, as, as you could see from the census data I show to you, yes, with some difficulties. Uh, and these new, not so new type of migrants are predominantly tertiary educated, uh, have English proficiency, are more gender balanced, significant uh, arrivals since the 2000s. Nearly 50% work as managers or professionals. Remember the figure, it was 47%. Uh, more percentage of Mexicans than Australians earning high salaries as I showed you with that graph on uh, the personal annual income. And in terms of occupational achievement, Mexicans fare better than their Latin American counterparts. Yet, uh, of course, I only compare to Brazil and Colombia, but it would be interesting to compare to other uh, migrant groups. Uh, but compared to them, um, Mexico, Mexicans fare better. Uh, yet, they are behind locals and Anglo migrants. Um, it's interesting to think, why do Mexicans fare better than Colombians and Brazilians? Um, um, official data, I would have to look at this, um, how many of them speak English well. I, uh, that's uh, something that I could do. I didn't do it this time. I just uh, took the entire people that had tertiary educated, were tertiary educated and had an occupation in Australia. But that would be interesting, maybe just comparing those who speak English very well and well, and then maybe the results would be considerably different. Um, so English as a factor uh, and why, and, and perhaps see why um, Mexicans, let's think why Mexicans in Australia have such a high level a high proficiency of English. And I think this has a lot to do with the main argument I have been pushing um, 
in my research and in my um, the books that I have published that these are Mexicans who come from a middle class background who were um, educated and learned English better or worse, but learned English as growing up uh, through school. And so there, um, they arrive in Australia with some level of English. Uh, just so you know, of the, um, of the research I have been conducting over the past five years of Mexican professionals tertiary educated in the United States, uh, I was quite surprised to find that a large number of them do not speak English. How do they fare in the labor market? Quite poorly. And these are tertiary educated Mexican migrants in the US. Why do Mexicans that are tertiary educated go to the US to look for a job if they don't speak English? Well, this is a topic for a different, obviously for a different talk, but interesting. What, what I want to highlight here is that most Mexicans that go to Australia speak English well, right? And then I found this on the internet. I found it funny that uh, I don't always go overseas, but when I do, I become a millionaire. I'm not saying that Australia, all Mexicans in Australia are millionaires, but uh, we see at the top of the bra income brackets, Mexicans do much better than, uh, not much better, but they do better than Australians. So it's quite interesting. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Laura, mm -hmm. muchísimas gracias por esa presentación. That was quite insightful. Now let's have some questions from the audience. I have some notes. Um, could you please repeat the sample size of, a, of your research in 2020? It's 20% of the uh, 3,500. 3, so that was, um, I think, 282 participants, I, I, re I think I remember, of the survey. So nearly, three, nearly 300. Nearly, yeah, nearly 300 people. Perfect, thank you. Another question was related to that beautiful chart on the comparison between Mexicans and Australians by salary bracket. Was that part of the 2010 or the 2016 census? 2016. Okay. Um, last one I took um, some notes on is, um, will you be, interested in using 2020 census data and come back for a future talk <laughs> yeah i'd love to i'd love to um yeah i have been as i mentioned earlier i have uh i have for a long time since i came back to mexico in 2013 i haven't uh done any research on australia very little research on mexicans in australia i started doing some research last uh, year and at the beginning of this year uh, but since then uh, i haven't done and uh thanks to your invitation elena i have been interested in trying to do more things because i well, because I work on these topics and then I find information and I find it fascinating. And of course, I would love to look at the most recent uh, census data, the 2021 20, 20, 20, mm -hmm. uh, census data uh, that will be available. They will start releasing some information from June, uh, this June, and they will take about a year to finish releasing all the information. Thank you for that. Um, do we have any other question from the audience? Feel free to unmute your mic if you want to ask directly. Yeah, Tania asked what I already answered. Is there any final data from the census taken in 2021? No, um, as I mentioned, and they, the ABS will start releasing that information as of June this year. And it will take about, as I said, a year for all the uh, information to be released. So as you can say, as you can see the, 
um, for economists that we work on with large databases, collecting a census is a major effort for any society. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Andre has a question on um, any knowledge of home ownership by Mexicans. Yeah, this is not in the in the census. There's no information regarding home ownership, but I did ask that um, in my um, in my own survey. And if I can pull up that information quickly, that I should be able to, I'll show it to you. Just one second. This is from my uh, survey. You can see there, 282 people. Um, 31, uh, this is in 2010, 31% had bought a home uh, in Australia. It seems like, uh, to me, it seems like a very high number. Remember, these are young uh, migrants, number one. And number two, they are uh, of fairly recent arrival. Most of them arrived, as you saw in the information I showed you, between 2006 and 2015. Um, so for one third of the population to have purchased a house, either own outright or paying off a mortgage, I think it's quite high, especially considering that a, um, uh, prices of the real estate in uh, Australia are astronomical. Laura, um, hi, how are you? Uh, hi. Really good to see you and, and, and thank you for this talk. It's really, really interesting. Um, I, I, I think it will be really interesting at some point. Uh, I remember discussing not just with Elena, but uh, with other exatechs, that it will be really interesting to probably conduct some surveys and try to understand more about the, the Mexican community uh, around here and of course uh, about the exotic community uh, itself so uh, it would be really interesting to maybe have a, a, a chat at some point with you and, and, and see what points might be relevant uh, to, to consider and maybe we can start uh, a little initiative to get more information about uh, the, com the Mexican community in, in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, at some point, I, th I think that would be very uh, interesting to do uh, if, if you're interested. So you mean to collect uh, more information? Yep. Exactly. <laughs> um, like, yes, we have good databases and not only Exotech, but other associations such as the Mexican and Cultural Association of Victoria. And Luis has some experience in, in market research as well. And well, research in general, he also has yeah. a PhD. So um, watch this space, maybe uh, take that converse, conversation offline, guys. Um, and if we do a survey to get to know Mexican community in Australia better. And you are interested in checking in a couple of questions as part of that. Um, Laura, please um, touch base with Luis. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to. I've been thinking that it's been over 10 years now, 12 years since I first collected that survey uh, where you two guys, Elena and Luis participated and some other people that are here. Um, I remember Ada, I, of course, uh, Alejand Alex Cabrera, um, and some others. Um, now, uh, Jorge Olivera says me, but I didn't interview you, Jorge. <laughs> um, I think it would be great to update. The thing is that it's a lot of work um, to not to collect the, the data, to analyze the data. And I'm, I've been thinking about doing it. It's just that I need to, you know, put my mind at it and make the time and um, finish what I'm doing currently. And uh, yeah, I would love to. L luckily, we have a few data scientists um, on this side. So yeah, we might be able to help. A there is with a it. good um, population <laughs> of data scientists, by the way, um, Everyone is invited to a future event we are going to run called Data Fest, which is Mexican uh, panelists who are working in data science. Um, we have a couple more questions uh, related to finding your book. Where can people find your book? Uh, the book is available online. You can purchase it through Amazon. We have another question. Do you have any insights or maybe your point of view? on whether this um, migration of uh, Mexican skilled migrants will increase after the pandemic? 
Um, it's hard to know. I think as I think maybe the pandemic was just not just. I mean, it has impacted our lives so significantly. But I think maybe it was just a pause in um, in our lives, and maybe people who were thinking or st have started thinking of going to Australia and Australia is allowing for people to migrate. I haven't, I know that they opened the borders, uh, which were closed. Maybe some of uh, uh, the Mexicans, some of my students that are here have no idea what it means to close the borders because in Mexico that <laughs> it's impossible and makes no sense. But while Australia was uh, had closed its borders for such a long time, now that they are reopened, maybe um, the flows will continue to grow just as they were, um, as the trend shows. I showed you that graph and I think it's pretty um, indicative that there's no reason why. I mean, I don't think there will be an explosion but just the numbers are going up and people are um, receiving the information from their family, their friends that are in Australia and that have had successful lives in Australia, that life is good in Australia, that there are difficulties. Some, um, of course, this book and my research it does not consider, uh, this is a very important um, uh, acceleration. Um, uh, my book does not consider all those unsuccessful stories of people that migrated to Australia, um, spent money, spent time, uh, had very high hopes and didn't make it and had to come back. Um, I know of one case, um, I, I, I personally knew one case while I was in Australia that uh, these women um, had a, uh, uh, permanent residence from Mexico, so uh, did her all the paperwork and migrated to Australia, tried uh, looking for a job. And after about, I don't remember, for a long time, maybe eight months, a year of not finding work and life uh, going down in a spiral circle, um, ended up go coming back to, to Mexico, obviously poor. She yes. didn't migrate poor and ended up coming back to Mexico in a very poor state. In a worse yeah. state. Yeah, it yeah. needs to be uh, very um, well thought and the strategic um, decision. Uh, we found sometimes people want to come with in debt, like uh, pay their expenses, asking for um, bank loans or some other institutions. And Australia is so expensive that it's really, really hard to do it in any way. Um, better to do with the permanent residency. Um, but you mentioned this case that even with that, there is a struggle. And what we need to understand that some people overlook is, although Australia is an English speaking country, their working culture is very different to the US. Um, US, Mexico and Canada are somehow similar in terms of um, how the recruitment process goes about, you know, just tell me what you achieved in the last year and your resume is one page and things like that. And in Australia, they like you to, to, to make it more like a curriculum vitae, how it used to be in Mexico, that you actually explain what you've done and break down your um, responsibilities and achievements. And also we assume that because we come from a, a big um, university or um, corporation in Mexico, Australia will know what that is about. And it doesn't matter how experienced you are, you need to um, get that local experience. And sometimes for Australian recruiters, it's more important to see a local experience in Australia, even if it's a volunteering job, but they want to see something Australian in your CV. And sometimes in Mexico, particularly if you are uh, money uh, poor, you want you, you don't want to, to work for free, right? And, and unfortunately, that it's a, that's a blockage because volunteering um, really makes a difference. Uh, an Australian recruiter told me and some other people uh, from different countries who have migrated, it does make a difference and um, unlocks things. So there's so many variables, how you approach recruiters, what your cover letter um, says, how you um, conduct yourself in an interview. So there could be many, many variables. And also who are you competing against? 
in Australia, there is a shortage, as you mentioned, in the skilled migration, particularly for um, highly scientific or engineering um, majors. But if, if you are from um, law or some social sciences or or, or a highly regulated uh, profession such as architecture or medicine, it's gonna take a while and it's not that easy. Whereas computer systems engineers or cybersecurity engineers, they, they would make it uh, very, very soon. So there, there are so many, many variables to consider. And to Dylan's question, insights on how make it, um, um, you know, communicate that Mexicans are high, highly skilled migrants. Well, that's what we're trying to do with, with Exatec and these uh, sort of events, tech trends and data fest and these type of talks like today, like um, to present Mexicans who have um, excelled in their areas of expertise and more and more we want to position that because as I was um, sharing with some of you on the chat, it doesn't really matter whether you are from Exatec, UNAM, La Salle, ITESO, ITAM, uh, Poli. Uh, really, um, a Mexican is um, usually hardworking. And if you come with good English, it's um, a matter of time. And, and yeah, but it's good to, to seek advice and, and learn and, and, and get that sort of local experience. Um, I don't see any other questions. So maybe we just... Um, have a, a big round of applause uh, to um, Laura for this fantastic talk. I'm trying to, to find the um, emojis, reactions. Here it goes. Thank and you.